I am proud to honor her on her birthday in recognition of her devotion to her family, friends, employees, and our whole Hoosier community. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, just last week I had the privilege of coordinating and, and working with other members of Congress to hold a briefing uh, with Judiciary Committee members to discuss uh, the jurisdiction of the hate crimes. We were privileged at that time in the midst of their mourning to have the parents of Trayvon Martin. I had a further privilege, though not wanted, to be in Sanford, Florida before their city commission to discuss the absolute dereliction of duty that occurred in this terrible tragedy. Now many have raised the question of race, and uh, let me be very clear. The race question comes into factor only because of jurisdictional federal laws of which they are now investigating this case. But this is a case for every American and every parent. It is a case that everyone can ask a simple question, as our speaker did. The state and federal jurisdictions are looking at this and they should review it. For those of us who believe that the perpetrator should be arrested, we maintain that. He should have been arrested and should be arrested. But this is a question for every parent that when you send your child out to get Skittles and a tea, whether they should come back alive or whether you should have to find them in a morgue. I remain persistent on finding justice for Trayvon, but justice for all of the other young people and others who have been victims of crimes like this with guns, where people have used their language of suspiciousness, and all they were doing is walking on the streets of America. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this will be the uh, last session before we go into uh, Easter district work period, I thought it was appropriate to look back at something historically. And I have a prayer that was given in the United States Senate in the 1940s by Senate Chaplain Peter Marshall. He said, we pray to thee, O Christ, to keep us under the spell of immortality. May we never again think and act as if thou wert dead. Let us more and more come to know thee as a living Lord, who hath promised to them that believe, because I live, ye shall live also. Help us to remember that we are praying to the conqueror of death, that we may no longer be afraid, nor be dismayed by the world's problems and threats, since thou hast overcome the world. In thy strong name, we ask for thy living presence and thy victorious power. Amen. That was Senate Chaplain Peter Marshall. A good prayer, Mr. Speaker, to pray as we head for the Easter recess. Now yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I will introduce the Detroit Growth and Stability Act, which will provide up to $500 million in loans to the city of Detroit. I'm asking this House, this Congress, and this administration to give Detroit the arsenal of democracy, a second chance, a second chance to build the best products, a second chance to create the best technologies that can be sold worldwide, which will create jobs, jobs not only for southeastern Michigan, because our city and our suburbs are linked together, but also jobs throughout this country. You see, the best way that we can renew America's economy, the most effective way, is to help rebuild Detroit. I urge your support of this important legislation, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. I rise today to commemorate a very important medical breakthrough that happened, though, hundreds of years ago in Jefferson, Georgia. 
and that's the invention of general anesthesia. Tomorrow is Doctor's Day, and I'm pleased to take this time to honor Dr. Crawford Long, who gave the first general anesthetic for a surgical procedure in 1842. If it weren't for Dr. Long's discovery of ether as a general anesthetic, the world of medicine would not be as profound or innovative as it is today. This is a proud claim for the city of Jefferson, Georgia, for the 10th Congressional District, and for the state of Georgia as a whole. It is a little known fact that Dr. Long's statue is in the U.S. Capitol as part of the National Statutory Hall Collection. But this tribute is well deserved given his significant contribution to both science and to medicine. I hope that all Georgians passing through Washington will take the time to stop by Dr. Long's statue to reflect upon this great Georgian's wonderful achievement to science and to humanity. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January the 5th, 2011, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Jones, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I um, again come to the floor to talk about a 10-year journey that I have been on with two wives whose husbands were tragically killed on April the 8th, 2000. The pilot was John Brown, Lieutenant Colonel, and the co-pilot was Brooks Gruber. They were flying what's known as a Osprey, it is a, uh, I will hold this up, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Osprey is, has been one of the, one of the planes that the Marine Corps for so long has needed to replace the aged helicopters uh, from the Vietnam era. The sadness and the problem was that the V-22, at the time that it was being flown by Colonel Brow and Major Gruber was not ready for the mission it had been assigned to. And Mr. Speaker, sadly that night, there were 17 young Marines in the back of that V-22 that crashed on April the 8th in Arizona. So a total of 19 Marines were killed. And the V-22 flipped and crashed and burned. December of 2002, the wife of Major Brooks Gruber, Connie Gruber, who lives in my district, Jacksonville, North Carolina, the home of Camp Lejeune Marine Base, she sent me an email, and I want to read one paragraph. I contact you in hopes that leaders of integrity, free of bias, would have both the intelligence and the courage it takes to decide the facts for him or herself. If you do that, you will agree the human factor slash pilot error findings should not stand in, it, is in military history. Again, I respectfully ask for your support. Please do not simply pass this matter along to General Jones without offering the support my husband and his comrades deserve. Please remember these 19 Marines can no longer speak for themselves. I certainly am not afraid to speak for them, and I believe somebody has to, even though it is easier put to rest and forgotten. Please join me in doing the right thing by taking the time to address this important issue. Mr. Speaker, along the way, there have been so many people to join me in asking the Marine Corps to correct the press release that came out in July of 2000. And I read from the press release, heading, Marine Corps officials say combination of factors caused Osprey accident. Confirms that a combination of human factors caused the April 8th crash of an MV-22 Osprey tilt rotor aircraft that killed 19 Marines. It further stated, Mr. Speaker, although the report stops short of specifying pilot error as a cause, it notes that the pilots of the ill-fated aircraft significantly exceeded the rate of descent established by regulations for safe flight. 
The tragedy, this is Commandant Jones at the time, who's now retired. The tragedy is in that these were all good Marines joining a challenging mission. Unfortunately, the pilot's drive to accomplish the mission appears to have been the fatal factor. Mr. Speaker, that is so erroneous, it is a pain for me to even repeat it on the floor of the House. I have spent 10 years trying to clear the names of pilot Colonel John Brown and his co-pilot, Major Brooks Gruber. If you look at the Jagman report, this is the report that was completed by three Marine officers who were sent the day after the accident to Marana, Arizona to investigate. And they published what was called a Jagman report. And I'd like to read the major section that I think says clearly that John Brow and Brooks Gruber were not at fault. During this investigation, we found nothing that we would characterize as negligence, deliberate pilot error, or maintenance material failure. During this investigation, we found nothing that we would characterize as negligence, deliberate pilot error. Mr. Speaker, I want to further read because this plane was not ready for the mission that it was assigned to by General Fred McCorkle, who was the general that oversaw aviation for the Marine Corps at the time. In fact, I read from an expert, Philip Corr, who understands the, the issue involved with this plane. He wrote me a page and a half in his support of clearing the names of John Brown and Brooks Gruber. And I read one paragraph. Considering that it was ignorance on the part of the Marine Corps that caused the April 2000 accident, the Marine Corps should make it clear to Major Gruber's family with no ifs or buts that Major Gruber was not responsible for the accident. Philip Cole further states, I do not suppose the Marine Corps ever apologizes, but considering that the accident was their fault and not Major Gruber's fault, an apology to the family would be in order also. Another one of those individuals who has joined us in this effort to clear the names is Rex Ravolo, well known in the aerospace industry as an expert. And I read, Mr. Speaker, the failure of the manufacturer, Bell Boeing, and the Navy to characterize the slow speed, high rate of descent handling qualities of the V-22 through flight testing, the failure to describe them for the air crew in the NATOPS, and the failure to provide an adequate warning system in the aircraft were the causes of the mishap, not the air crew. Mr. Speaker, I reached out to the two attorneys who prosecuted, who filed suit against Bell Boeing in behalf of the families. Jim Furman, himself a Vietnam helicopter pilot, was the attorney for the wives of John Brow and Brooks Gruber. Brian Alexander in New York and his associate Francis Young they represented the 17 families whose sons were burned to death. I'm not an attorney, Mr. Speaker, but I must say, knowing that Bell Boeing settled, no one knows how much money because it is closed. But they settled with the families, the 19 Marines who were burned to death. And Jim Furman has joined me in saying that these two pilots had not been trained. There was no warning system. And Mr. Speaker, the NATOPS manual is what the pilots have between them that explains if you get into this kind of situation, you can read and see how to react. The NATOPS manual they had was written by an Army helicopter pilot 
and nothing in there about vortex ring state, which is a phenomenon that can cause the plane, particularly a V-22, to flip. And Major Gruber and Colonel Bro had no idea. And Mr. Speaker, I would like to read comments from the attorney, Jim Furman. If there was no human error, it was error for the program manager to certify the aircraft as airworthy when clearly it was not. Brow and Gruber found themselves in a position of having to do what they were not trained or qualified to do. Jim Furman further stated, it was not the mission of the operations evaluation crew to discover the new boundaries and limitations associated with the V-22. Engineering test pilots under appropriate test conditions should have done this. It is simply wrong and improper to place this burden upon Gruber and Brow. They did the best job they could have done under the circumstances. Mr. Speaker, all the wives are asking, Connie Gruber and Trish Brow, is asking that the United States Marine Corps, on the letterhead of the Commandant of the Marine Corps, write one paragraph that says Colonel John Brow and Major Brooks Gruber, pilot and co-pilot, were not responsible for the accident on April the 8th, 2000. I am very disappointed in the Marine Corps, quite frankly. I have Camp Lejeune Marine Base in my district, New River Air Station, and Cherry Point Marine Air Station. I'm not disappointed in the Marines. They're a magnificent fighting force for this country. But I never thought that I would be fighting for one paragraph with the United States Marine Corps. These two pilots deserve better than having this blemish against their names. And Mr. Speaker, there are so many people that have joined in this. The three investigators, Colonel Mike Morgan, Colonel Ron Radish, Major Phil Stackhouse, Stackhouse excuse me, have given me letters independent of the Jagman report that have clearly stated that nothing in their investigation should indicate that this was pilot error. I have given this to the attorneys for the Commandant. In addition, Jim Schaefer, at the time a lieutenant colonel, was in the air in the third V-22. And John Brown and Brooks Gruber were his friends. He's joined in this effort to clear their names. It does not make any sense, Mr. Speaker, that the Marine Corps cannot do what has been asked by the wives. The wives have just asked for one paragraph that clearly states. And Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, the Marine Corps owes this to the families because they came out with this press release that I just read a moment ago in 2000 and indicated that this was pilot error. They have seen all the information that I have accumulated in 10 years. And all the families are asking for their children. Connie has a little girl named Brooks. Trish has two boys named Michael and Matthew. All they're asking is an official letter from the United States Marine Corps that the children can have for years to come. And whenever it comes about, the crash on April the 8th, 2000 in Arizona was pilot error. And Mr. Speaker, they can say, no, that's not true. I have a letter from the United States Marine Corps, Commandant, that clearly states that my father was not at fault. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank The Hill Magazine today. I'm sorry that I had to be featured in it. 
because the most important thing about the article, and I want to thank Jeremy Herb, who spent so much time on this article. He interviewed the commandant. He interviewed General McCorkle, who was the aviation chief at the time of this crash. And he interviewed the wives. And again, they clearly understand that if you want to bring rest to two outstanding Marines who have been blamed for this crash, Mr. Commandant, all you've got to do is write a letter with one paragraph in it. The wives have given you what they request. And I'm calling on the United States Marine Corps today, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, to please do what is right. You have the evidence. The attorneys that sued Bill Bowen over this accident know more than anyone, including the Commandant, about what happened and who was at fault. And again, Jim Furman and Brian Alexander have joined in this effort. I hope that the Marine Corps will give the wives what they're asking for. And Mr. Speaker, if we could ever bring this journey to an end, I intend to go to the cemetery in Jacksonville, North Carolina, with Connie Gruber and her daughter Brooks. And I want to walk to the grave of the husband and the father and say, Major Brooks Gruber, rest in peace. The blame game is over. You're not to blame for the accident. And then, Mr. Speaker, I would like to go with Trish Brow and her sons Matthew and Michael to Arlington and say the same thing to Colonel Brow. Colonel, you have earned the rest. You did nothing wrong to cause that accident. Mr. Speaker, it makes no sense that these wives and the children have to, had to carry this burden because, Mr. Speaker, too many times articles are written, books are written that say one accident in the history of the Osprey was caused by pilot error. And they're talking about John Brown and Brooks Gruber. And they're talking about the accident in Arizona. And I give you one quick example, Mr. Speaker. The book called Leathernecks, it was published about four years ago. And the father of Colonel Brooks Gruber is living. His name is Bill Gruber. He lives in Naples, Florida. He fought for this country as a Marine in the Korean War. And he's carried the pain of this blemish on his son's name. And he called me a couple years ago. He knew what I was trying to do for the families. And he called me here in Washington, D.C. about two years ago and said, Congressman, they've done it again. So what's that, Mr. Gruber? On page 113 of the new edition of Leathernecks, they've got a section on the Osprey. And they say one accident was due to pilot error. Mr. Speaker, I'm a strong man of faith, and I prayed every night that God would touch the hearts of those who can make the decision to clear the names of Colonel John Brow and Major Brooks Gruber. And as long as I serve the Congress, as long as I have the energy to fight for these two men, I will continue to fight until the Marine Corps does what is right. And what is right is to give Connie Gruber, Trish Brow, an official letter with one paragraph on it. And we will ask that the Marine Corps issue a national press release that the Commandant has done this so that the press in years to come will always be able to look at that press release by the Marine Corps and see that Colonel John Brow and Major Brooks Gruber, young men who died too early in their life through no fault of their own, 
We had 17 young Marines, the oldest being 23, in the back of the V-22 that crashed. That they are not at fault for this accident. Mr. Speaker, as I do before I close, uh, I ask God to please bless our men and women in uniform and their families. I ask God to bless the families who have given a child dying for freedom in Afghanistan and Iraq. I ask God to please bless the families of John Brown and Brooks Gruber. And I ask God to touch the heart of the Marine Corps and the Commandant to bring these two men image to respect and not an image that is blemished by the accident. I ask God to bless the House and Senate and my good friend sitting here, his families. I ask God to bless everyone in America. I ask God to bless the House and Senate that we will do what is right in the eyes of God for God's people. And I ask God to please bless the President that he will do what is right in the eyes of God for God's people. And three times I will ask God please, God please, God please continue to bless America and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January the 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Got to get my Well, Mr. Speaker, my name is Keith Ellison. I'm co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. And uh, I say, God, please bless Walter Jones. Mr. Speaker, uh, we're here today uh, with the Progressive Caucus message today. Uh, our uh, website is listed on the bottom at cpc.grahalva.house.gov. We come every week with a progressive message uh, the Progressive Caucus, uh, there are, uh, is a caucus in the Congress. There are several. There's, the, of course, the big caucus is the two big ones. There's the Democratic Caucus. There's the Republican Caucus. But within both, there are different groups that uh, have points of agreement that they come together around. On the Republican side, there's a Republican study group. On the Democratic side, there are in several caucuses. There's the Black Caucus. There's the Hispanic Caucus. There's the Blue Dog Caucus. There are different groups. The Progressive Caucus is a caucus within the Democratic Caucus. We'd be happy to have Republican members if they ever wanted to join, but mo all of our members are Democrats, and we believe that America should be a place where there's liberty and justice for all. That means whether you're Hispanic or Latino or African American, one America. We believe that the working men and women of America should get a fair, decent wage, and that the people who are most privileged in our society, God bless them, but they should pay adequate taxes so that we can afford the basic necessities of our society, schools, roads, uh, you know, uh, and take care of our environment, things like that. We believe we should stay out of, these, out of these wars unless they're necessary to defend the American people. So we are promoting diplomacy, and we are very proud to, to say that we, we are the liberal caucus. We're the progressive caucus. We're the ones who believe fairness, inclusion, and that Yes, the government has a responsibility uh, because it is our, our, our collect the way we all come together as Americans uh, to the poor, and we should, we should stand by that and stick by that. That's who the Progressive Caucus is. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've been dealing with budget this week. Budget, it's been budget week, you could say. And we started out the week, we were talking about uh, the Republican budget drafted by Mr. Paul Ryan. We went from there. We talked about the Democratic budget drafted by Mr. Chris Van Hollen. And then, of course, the Progressive Caucus budget came up. The Black Caucus budget came up. I think Mr. Uh, Melvin, Melvin uh, came up with a, with a budget proposal. They put the President's, uh, a very, very watered down and inaccurate version of the President's budget up there. Uh, and uh, we've been talking budget. 
And Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the budget, what we're talking about is the values and priorities of America. It's important to keep this in mind. What shows up in your budget is what you care about. What does not show up in your budget is what you don't care about. Now, Mr. Speaker, I always caution people not to just take their family budget and the United States budget and assume they're basically the same thing, one just as bigger than the other. That's not exactly accurate. There are important differences, and we shouldn't mix up the two. But in this way, they are similar in that they reflect what it is that people value. If you have a family and their budget, they, you can look at their budget, they spend a lot of money on, uh, on entertainment, you can pretty much figure they value that. If they put a lot of money into food, you can figure they definitely think that is a priority for them. If, they, I mean, if, if you look and go through the family, you can go through the budget, see what people spend their money on, see what people don't have in their budget, and then you can pretty much figure, well, maybe that's not a priority for them. Of course, you say my name may, might be able to, may not be able to afford it at this time, but if you talk about reasonably middle class people and it's not in their, their budget reflects what they care about, what matters and what doesn't. And for our nation, that certainly is, a tr is true. If our nation puts more money into warfare than it does into social uplift, jobs, economy, and, and the infrastructure, that says something about who we are. If our, if our national budget puts more money into uh, infrastructure and jobs and, and putting people back to work, uh, then that says something about who we are. And the various budgets that have come up, Mr. Speaker, reflect what the various caucuses think is important and project a vision for our country. And I want to talk about that today. I want to start by talking about Paul Ryan's budget. Paul Ryan's the Republican Budget Committee Chair, nice guy. I don't have anything bad to say about him personally because he's actually a nice person. But the fact is that we disagree in a significant way about what the priorities of America should be. For example, the Republican budget, 20 children will lose access to Head Start to pay for one millionaire's tax cut. That's what their budget. Just if you want to understand what their tax cuts represent, it means 20 kids don't get to go to Head Start so that a millionaire can get a tax cut. 150,000 equals 20 times 7,500. 7, so if you look at this tax cut, a millionaire's tax cut, which will amount about $150,000, these little guys, they don't get to go to Head Start. Now, what is Head Start? Head Start is a great program for low-income kids to make sure that they have a, a chance uh, at getting a quality education and don't fall behind uh, in school. And so this is a great program, has great results. These Head Start kids, they're, they're, the 20 of them going to Head Start versus what, uh, what a millionaire's tax cut would be, which is $150,000. Now, this is the choice we're making. You know, Mr. Speaker, we should not act like we're not making choices. We are making choices. We are deciding. My friends in the Republican side of the aisle like to say, oh, we shouldn't pick winners and losers. We're always doing it. They just pick the rich people. And we, I picked the kids in Head Start. Also, Mr. Speaker, if you just want to get a sense of what the Republican budget, you know, what it does, what, it's, what the tax cuts that it's calling for mean, Republican budget, 150 college students will have their Pell Grants cut by $1,000 to pay for one millionaire's tax cut. So one millionaire's tax cut, $150,000, but 150 times 1,000, all these kids, these college kids trying to make something of themselves, their Pell Grant's going to get whacked by a thousand bucks. So these, again, choices. Do we want to make sure the country club set is doing even better, or do we want to make sure that these, these aspiring engineers, these aspiring doctors and teachers, these aspiring police officers, these aspiring workers of tomorrow, we'll have a shot at an affordable college education. This is what we're talking about. These are the choices that we're making, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's very important that Americans know it. It's critical that we know it. Now, let's just not stop there. Let's talk about other critical choices being made, Mr. Speaker, because I think that it's so critical 
that as we're talking budget week and all the budget decisions that we are making, that we make it real clear to the American people what it is we're choosing. Republican budget, 216 pregnant or postpartum women, infants and children would lose access to WIC. That's Women, Infants and Children Program, and it provides food for poor women and their kids to pay for one millionaire's tax cut. So $150,000 tax cut for a millionaire, again, this is the country club set, equals about 216 pregnant women or postpartum women and the amount of money that Americans give them so that they can have good nutrition for their kids. These are poor women. These are women who are struggling economically, but just because they're struggling economically, we don't want their kids to go without good, nutritious food. So as Americans, we have the WIC program. Well, they're going to get sliced out of the program because a millionaire needs a tax cut. Uh, that's the choices that we're making. And I want to talk about why we're making that choice in a minute, but I want to give one more example. The Republican budget, 25 seniors pay 6000 or more for Medicare to pay for one millionaire's tax cut. So if you're a millionaire and you get a tax cut under what the Republicans want to give you, you're already doing good, but they want you to even do better, that will mean that you got about 25 seniors who have to pay $6,000 a piece uh, more uh, for their Medicare. So mom, dad, I don't know if you're my age, mom and dad are senior citizens. If you're younger, they're not. But if you're parents or grandparents or on Medicare, and they're doing all they can on their fixed income to make it, they're going to need a little extra help because we got to make sure that that millionaire gets his $150,000 tax cut. These are the choices that we're making. Now, my friends in the Republican caucus, God bless them, it's not like they don't like poor people. Many of them are very charitable. They give in their different walks of life, maybe their faith community or whatever, they just don't think government should do it. This is what they say. They think that government needs to get out of that and let churches, mosques, synagogues, and other folks do it. Of course, that would mean that it wouldn't get done because even though church, mosques, synagogues do great work, they can never possibly come up to meet the need that's out there. But what they're really believing is, this is what they really believe. They believe in something called trickle-down economics. They believe that if you give this millionaire $150,000 more dollars than he already has, he will maybe, hopefully, perhaps, invest it in plant and equipment, and maybe somebody will get a job because of it. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. But, or maybe he'll invest in China and maybe get some, he'll improve jobs, but just not in America. Or no, nobody knows what they will do with this tax cut, but this is what the Republicans believe. They think that if you give rich people more money, they will invest in plant and equipment, create more economic activity, and it will trickle down to the rest of us. The only problem is that it has never worked. It doesn't stop them from saying it, but it's never worked. In fact, the GOP budget will destroy more than 4 million American jobs in next to two years, according to the Economic Policy Institute. The Economic Policy Institute estimates that, quote, the shock to aggregate demand from near-term spending cuts would result in about 100, no, excuse me, would result in roughly 1.3 million jobs lost in 2013 and 2.8, almost 3 million jobs uh, through 2014, or 4.1 million jobs through the total of 2014. So a little bit more than 4 million jobs over the next two years. Now people might think, well, Keith, is that right? Well, yeah, it's right, and I'll tell you why it's right. It's right because when Republicans say we need to cut government waste, we need to cut government, cut government, cut government, they act as if there's some just think government thing over there, like it's a big giant piece of styrofoam and they could just cut it and it doesn't change anything. What they're talking about cutting are federal workers. <laughs> They're talking about laying off federal workers. 
and they very derisive about government jobs and act like people who work for the government don't do anything of value. Of course, this is not true at all. But if you look on this chart right here, Mr. Speaker, it says, I earn less than 45000 a year. Explain to me, GOP, how cutting my pay creates jobs. And this particular person is named Paul, and uh, he is an Army Depot worker. I think we need Army Depot workers. Teresa is, uh, is a nurse, and this is her right here. She uh, lives in my district. And she says, 12% of, sal of the salary I earn caring for veterans goes to my retirement. Explain to me, GOP, how cutting my retirement puts people to work. Well, one of the things that they do in the Ryan budget is cut into federal workers' retirement. And so that is, that's, you know, they act like, oh, the government. No, the government is people. The government is nurses. The government is Army Depot workers. And what about federal prisons that keep dangerous criminals behind bars? I pay more than $9,000 a year in, for my family's health insurance. Explain to me, GOP, how cutting my take-home pay lowers unemployment. This guy is a corrections officer. And thank goodness for correction officers or the streets that we live in wouldn't be so nice. The bottom line is, when Republicans say, oh, we're going to shrink the size of government, what they mean is they're going to lay off and cut the pay and cut the employment benefits of federal workers. People who work in prisons and at risk to themselves, nurses who care for our veterans, and people who are Army Depot workers, and people who work in our parks, and people who fix our roads, and a whole lot of other people. Here's a chart for you, Mr. Speaker. If you look at the federal, if you look at the Ryan budget, if you look at the GOP proposal. If you look at it and they could do what they wanted to do, it could cause a loss up to 7 million uh, jobs by 2016 because it would cut federal workers and then they wouldn't be able to have the money to spend in the neighborhoods they live in anymore. That would then have a ripple effect in their neighborhoods because they're buying less. For example, if that, if, 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 if that young nurse at the VA in Minnesota if she doesn't have um, the, the same pay as she had before, then she can't buy as much as she bought before. Then the company she shops at doesn't sell her as much as they had before. You do that enough, multiply times enough people, and that company then needs to lay, start laying off people. So it's a ripple effect of what the Republicans are asking for. But if you, but if you look at what they wanted, and I'm talking about all, going all the way back to HR1, which was their proposal, you would see mm -hmm. Repealing health care reform, that would cut about $2 million. The GOP budget, that would cut about $3 million. Cuts the federal workforce, that would cut about 285000 The so-called Jobs Act, that would cut a lot. The fair tax, that would cut. And they would just cut on down the line. What they're basically proposing is by shrinking government and by doing all that stuff, they're getting rid of people. Now, I just want to be on the record because your words do get twisted. If there is a federal program that is not justifiable and is so poorly run that it's of no value to anyone, I'm okay with cutting it. I just want to say that on the record on the House floor, Mr. Speaker, I'm all right with cutting programs that don't work. But when you're talking about VA nurses and when you talk about corrections workers in federal prisons, we need these people. They do good stuff. And I believe that we should stand by them as they stand by us. The GOP budget, now going back to the budget we t addressed today, will shift costs to, to seniors in Medicare guarantee according to the ARP. And what's ARP? That's the leading organization representing retired persons. And the CBO. What's the CBO? Uh, that's the Congressional Budget Office. And for folks who like to watch C-SPAN, I just say, Mr. Speaker, that you need to know what CBO is because this is very important. Congressional Budget Office, they're the nonpartisan group that says what's really going on with the numbers. At the same time, it is raising the seniors' costs. This GOP budget gives those making more than a million a year uh, a, 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 an average tax cut uh, of about 394000 So I put 150 up there a moment ago. That was the generic millionaire. The actual number is about 394 uh, for the average uh, millionaire per year on the average tax cut. Uh, and also, <clears throat> also, 
the tax breaks for big oil companies, you know, they, they get about $4 billion a year. I'm talking about if you look at Conoco, Exxon Mobil, and all the big oil companies, they get about $4 billion a year. Now, how much did you pay for gasoline? Do, I'm not saying that they're not good people. I'm not saying that they don't run a good business and supply an important product. I'm just asking you this. Does Exxon Mobil really need your money through a tax subsidy? Do they? I think that they don't need your money. I think that they are get, their $4 a gallon is taking care of them just fine. And I think it's outrageous that the Republican budget that we dealt with does not eliminate that tax break. In short, the big oil companies who are gouging Americans at the pump and the wealthiest Americans win while middle class and working class families get the short end of the stick. Last year, oil profits, and this is an exact number or close to, to it, Last year, oil, big oil profits totaled about $137 billion. But you don't need to remember $137 billion. All you need to remember is big oil profits were the biggest ever that the oil industry ever had. And yet, we're forking it over to them through our tax money, not through the pumps. Some people might think, well, of course we're paying them, Keith. Through the pump, they give us gas. We've got to get to work, so we need to buy the gas. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying... They, get, they can apply for grants and subsidies, and it all adds up to about $4 billion a year. Um, with soaring gasoline prices, Big Oil's 2012 profits will even be bigger. Yet Republicans want to give Big Oil more money in our tax dollars, and it just doesn't make any sense. Now, of course, you don't, shouldn't expect the big oil companies like ExxonMobil to say, we don't want the money. Of course they want the money. Who doesn't want money? Everybody does, including them. But the people who have a public responsibility to look out for the American people should be willing to say no to public subsidies for the ExxonMobil's of this world. And again, if you work for ExxonMobil, I'm not running you down. I'm just saying that you're doing well enough and you don't need the help of the American people. You can do fine on your own. Now, those kids on Head Start need help. They need help. Those college kids need help but not ExxonMobil executives. <clears throat> the major consequence for Medicare and Medicaid, the Ryan budget, the Republican budget, the ma has big consequences for Medicaid and Medicare. Many seniors will be forced to pay sharply higher premiums to stay in traditional Medicare and keep their current choice of doctors. New Medicare beneficiaries would pay more than $1,200 uh, more than uh, by 2030 and more than 6,000 by 2050. Before more seniors would gradually shift to private health insurance plans over time, increasing privatization of Medicare. More than 47 million Americans would lose health care insurance uh, over 10 years because they would get rid of Obamacare. Now my friends in the Republican aisle, when they say Obamacare, they don't mean it in a nice way. It's uh, an insult. But you know what? Obama does care. So I don't mind them saying Obamacare. I hope they keep saying it because they're just reminding Americans that Obama cares about them and that uh, the people the Republicans want to look out for apparently do not. Um, states uh, under the uh, Republican plan uh, would be forced to slash Medicaid eligibility, benefits, and payments to health care providers. Their budget shreds Medicaid safety net and shifts health care costs to states and beneficiaries, blocking Medicaid. This shifts all risks, including future recessions, health care cost increases, and disasters to states and beneficiaries. So here's the thing. This, this, this Ryan budget, this Republican Ryan budget, it, it, it helps and takes care of the rich. It ignores everyone else, um, and it hurts the middle class. The Republican budget would weaken the middle class in important ways. First and foremost, it, it, the, their plan ends the Medicare guarantee of decent health insurance for in retirement. It also slashes critical middle class investments such as education and infrastructure by 45% and 24% respectively. Education by 45%, infrastructure by 24%. Now look, the American Society of Civil Engineers, Mr. Speaker, have told us that we have crumbling infrastructure in this country to the tune of about 2.2 to $3 trillion, a lot of money. And if you are living in any city across this country, you can drive over 75-year-old bridges, 
You can drive over potholes. You can, our sewage systems need upgrade. I am from Minneapolis, Minnesota, a city I love so much, but back a few years ago, we had a bridge fall into the Mississippi River because the gusset plates, which are those plates that hold up the bridge, gave way because uh, the adequate uh, maintenance just wasn't maintained over time. Now, it happened to us, but it could happen anywhere. There are many structurally deficient bridges across this nation, literally thousands. We could put people back to work if we put the money into taking care of them. And not only would we have people working, we'd have safe bridges to go over. But the Republican majority, uh, to use their phrase, kicks the can down the road and doesn't deal with this looming infrastructure crisis. So let me just say this. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the so-called Ryan Republican budget. I don't want to spend all my time talking about it, but I do think it's important for Americans to know that this is a budget for the 1%. This is a budget for people who got it well, who are doing fine. Now, let me just tell you, I, have no, I swear I am a big fan of well-to-do people. I, have many, I, I wish I were one of them. <laughs> but my point is that that you don't need to help people who already have a lot of help on their own. But you do need to help school kids, Head Start kids, pregnant moms, poor, pregnant low-income moms, seniors. These people we should help. People who are doing fine, they don't need our help. They should do the helping, in my opinion. And yet the Ryan budget says we're just going to help the country club set. And I think that's not any way to have a budget. I'm going to talk about the Progressive Caucus budget, but I just want you to know first that the Ryan Republican budget is no good budget for America. In fact, it's premised on the theory that rich people don't have enough money and poor people have too much. Really, that's the, fundament, that's the animating, organizing feature of their, of their budget, that if we gave rich people more money then they might invest it in plant equipment and then it'll trickle down to the rest of us. And poor people have too much stuff. We can't afford it. Can't afford Head Start. Can't afford WIC. Can't afford home heating oil for seniors. Can't afford Medicare. Can't afford Medicaid. The, 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 the poor folks are just, they're, they're, they're getting treated too well. And, and that's basically what the theory is of the Republican budget. And um, so that's fine. And I uh, respect them for being real honest about what they believe in, because a budget is a reflection of our values. So now that we've talked about, <clears throat> about what they're talking about, let's talk about a real budget, not for the 1%, but a budget for all. The Progressive Caucus budget has a name. The name of the Progressive Caucus budget is the budget for all. That's the name of the Progressive Caucus budget, because unlike the Republican budget, which is a budget for the 1%, this is a budget for all. And let me tell you what it does, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> it creates 3.3 million jobs in the first two years. It cuts the deficit by nearly $7 trillion, $6.8 trillion. No benefit cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. The budget for all makes the American dream a reality again for the vast majority of Americans. By putting Americans back to work, the budget for all enhances our economic competitiveness by rebuilding the middle class and investing in innovation and education. Our budget protects Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, invests in America's future, and asks those who have benefited the most from our economy to pay their fair share. Now, as I said, um, you can't have a budget. You can have a budget that cuts taxes for rich people if you then cut services for poor people. And you can have a budget that pays for infrastructure and education, but the money has to come from somewhere. And we ask people who already have lots of it to do a little more for their fellow Americans. We're not hiding that fact. Yes, we would raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans, not, because, not to punish them, because we don't think taxes are punishment, but because it's necessary to meet the needs of the nation, and any self-respecting patriot would do so if they could. In fact, there's a group out there, and you, I, would go, I would urge you to check them out, Mr. Speaker, called Patriotic Millionaires, who understand that 
they may need to pay higher taxes. But if you already are making a million dollars a year, would, it really, would you pay a little extra to make sure that, uh, that, that, that uh, low-income pregnant women got some food for their kids? If you already making a million or more a year, would you pay a little extra to make sure that head, little kids got Head Start to go to? If you're already making a million dollars a year, Mr. Speaker, would you pay a little extra to just make sure that, uh, that the federal workers uh, don't have their pensions cut to pay for your tax cut? Uh, that's just my thinking. I just, my, that's just my thinking. And I don't want anybody to think the Republicans are mean. They're, they do charitable work in their individual lives. And that's a fact, and I think people ought to know that. But they don't think government has any role in helping people. I disagree with that. And call Americans, Mr. Speaker, to look carefully at the choices that they offer. The budget for all, not a budget for the 1%, not a budget for the 99%, but a budget for all because we care about the 1% too. Because we want even the 1% to live in a good nation with fairness, with economic opportunity, with economic mobility, with good roads, good bridges, good education, clean water, clean air. We want this for everyone. The, the budget for all attacks America's persistently high unemployment levels with more than $2.4 trillion over 10 years in job-creating investment. This plan utilizes every tool at the government's disposal to get our economy moving again, including direct hire programs that create school improvement corps, a park improvement corps, student job corps, and others. Targeted tax incentives that spur clean energy manufacturing cutting edge technological investment in the private sector. Widespread domestic investment including Infrastructure Bank, a $556 billion surface transportation bill, unlike this thing that they tried to pass today, which is a three month extension. Oh, by the way, Mr. Speaker, can you believe it? The Republican caucus is always going on and on about uncertainty. And what did they do? Create uncertainty by passing some three-month transportation bill. My goodness. It's, it's, it boggles the mind, actually. Um, and back to the budget for all, uh, approximately $1.7 trillion in widespread domestic investment. Unlike the Republican budget, the budget for all substantially reduces the deficit and does so in a way that does not devastate what Americans value. We achieve these notable benchmarks by focusing on the true drivers of our deficit, unsustainable tax policy, wars overseas, and the policies that help cause recent recession, rather than putting the, the, the middle class and social safety net on the chopping block. The budget creates a fairer America, ends tax cuts for the wealthiest 2 percent of Americans on schedule at the year's end, extend tax relief for middle class uh, households and the vast majority of Americans, creates new tax brackets for millionaires and billionaires in line with the Buffett rule principle, eliminates tax codes preferential treatment for capital gains and dividends, abolishes corporate welfare for oil, gas and coal companies, eliminates loopholes that allow businesses to dodge their true tax liability, creates publicly funded federal election system that gets uh, corporate money out of politics for good. Responsibly and expeditiously ends our military presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, leaving America more secure at home and abroad. It also adapts our military to address 21st century threats through modernization. The Department of Defense will spend less and stop contributing to the deficit, but they will have uh, what they need to keep America strong, which is very important to all of us. Provides, a work, make it, make, provides making work pay tax credit for families struggling with high gas and food costs. Extends earn, earned income tax credit um, uh, and child dependent care credit. Invest in programs to stave off further foreclosure. Invest in children's education by increasing education training and social services. So the budget for all is a budget for all. I know that sounds repetitive, but it's important to note that the name of our budget reflects the reality of our budget, and the reality of our budget is that we want to see rich, poor, and everybody in the middle do well in America, and that means a budget for all. So as I begin to wind down, Mr. Speaker, I just want to say that it is an honor to come before you to talk about the budget for all, but it's also an honor to talk about the Ryan Republican budget because 
The Ryan Republican budget offers a very different vision of America than the budget for all. The Ryan vision says that, you know what, if we just could get rich people more money, they might create some plant and equipment that will hire the rest of us. And the budget for all says, no, we're in this together, and we're going to ask the wealthiest to pay more to invest in health, education, uh, transportation, uh, and, and infrastructure so that we can have a stronger, better, greater America. Two visions of a nation. One says austerity for the middle and working class and the poor, and one says investment. One says if you are out of luck, you're on your own. One says as Americans, we're all in this together. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to be here and offer these, these contrasts, these, these choices for Americans as we close out what I call Budget Week. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman yields back.